So lovely to see all your smiling faces and if you are joining us online as well, a huge welcome to you or maybe you're watching on Channel 44, a big hello. Uh, we are starting this series called Standing Strong. Standing Strong. Why are we doing this series? <laughs> Well, we know that God the Father wants all people to come to know Him, to belong in His family, to find freedom in Christ. We know that He wants people to have life in all its fullness. We also know that God wants His kids to be growing in Christ-like character, to be firm and immovable in trusting Jesus. So whether you're already part of this family or you have been for decades. <laughs> whether you're new to this church or whether you're just checking out what Jesus is all about, I believe this message is for you. And I trust that as you open up your heart, you will hear what it is that God's saying to us today. Do you know, in God's eyes, standing strong looks very different to how our world views standing strong. In our world's eyes, standing strong looks like self-reliance, self-preservation, self-determination, self-belief, even self-promotion. There's a lot of one word in there. What would that be? (laughs) Yeah. Tim Keller has quoted or has said that, uh, and I think it's a great summary, that uh, we are living in the age of the sovereign self. There's a lot of focus on what's your truth, what's good for you, what's best for you, whatever you choose, whatever you determine. But in God's eyes, standing strong is just the opposite. And it can be seen, a great illustration um, I felt God bring to mind this week is from the story of Moses. Moses was uh, a very precious baby um, that was rescued from a river. And he was adopted into Pharaoh's family by Pharaoh's daughter because Pharaoh had decided that he wanted to kill a whole heap of baby Hebrew boys. And so he ends up in this royal family adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and In the book of Acts, Stephen actually talks about Moses, tells part of his story. Let's have a listen to what he said. Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both speech and action. One day when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, the people of Israel. He saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite, So Moses came to the man's defence and avenged him, killing the Egyptian. Moses assumed his fellow Israelites would realise that God had sent him to rescue them, but they didn't. (laughs) I love how the Bible is so honest, so raw, gives us all the gory details. No, they didn't. Sorry, Moses. (laughs) And so the next day he tries to be a peacemaker and uh, sees these two Egyptian, oh, sorry, Israelite men fighting and he intervenes to try and stop the fight and they just react to him and they say, well, who made you ruler and judge over us? Have you come to kill us like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And he's horrified and he runs away. And there in the back, back sticks of a desert, <laughs> God starts to speak to him. Moses wanted to help. And you think, what's wrong with that? (laughs) I think the scripture's trying to show us there that he mistakenly saw himself as the deliverer rather than God. We do that sometimes, right? I think the Holy Spirit needs a lot of help from us. (laughs) 40 years later, God gets his attention and calls to him from a burning bush. God tells Moses that he has seen his, the oppression of his people and he has come down to rescue them. <laughs> he tells Moses to go and speak to Pharaoh and reassures him that God himself, the great I am, will be with him because Moses had to learn 
to trust and depend on God instead of relying on his own self-confidence. And so just like the raw, unedited and painfully honest stories of his people throughout history, the Bible reminds us and God is reminding us today in 1 Corinthians 10 in the message it says, our positions in the story or God's master story are parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end and we are just as capable of messing it up as they are. (laughs) Straight to the point. (laughs) In verse 12, it says, don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. Cultivate God confidence. So how do we do that? (laughs) How do we cultivate God confidence? Well, That is a great question and this series is going to help us do just that as we learn to stand strong in the victory that Jesus won for us. Writing to the church in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul addresses them as God's holy people, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And I want to read to you just a little description that John Stott talks about Ephesians because it helps us understand the big overarching purpose of the book and the message. The letter focuses on what God did through the historical work of Jesus Christ and does through his spirit today. It tells how Jesus Christ shed his blood in a sacrificial death for sin, was then raised from death by the power of God and has been exalted above all competitors to the supreme place in both the universe and the church. More than that, we who are in Christ, organically united to him by faith, have ourselves shared in these great events. We have been raised from spiritual death, exalted to heaven and seated with him there. We have also been reconciled to God and to each other. As a result, through Christ and in Christ, we are nothing less than God's new society, the single new humanity which he is creating and which includes Jews and Gentiles on equal terms. We are the family of God the Father, the body of Jesus Christ the Son and the temple or the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are to demonstrate plainly and visibly by our new life the reality of this new thing that God has done. And so a way of understanding Ephesians is the first three chapters talk about where we sit, that we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places because of what Jesus has done and who we are now in Christ, we can rest in his finished work. Chapters 4 and 5 and the first part of chapter 6 and say in light of what he's done, in light of who we now are in Christ, this is how we can now live in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to have unity and diversity of gifts in the body of Christ and maturity. This is what it means to have mutual submissiveness and care in our relationships at home. He talks about walking in that part so there's the sit first three chapters and he talks about walk how do we walk out our life in Christ and then he talks about particularly in verses 10 to 19 in chapter 6 he talks about this is how you stand this is how you stand strong in Christ this is how you stand against the spiritual attack of the enemy who knows he's lost the war (laughs) but wants to inflict as much damage as possible before he's destroyed forever. So over the coming weeks, we'll be focusing on this scripture passage, Ephesians 6, 10 to 19. I want to encourage you, read it in a whole stack of translations. Read it in the message paraphrase. Reflect on it. Let it sink deep into your spirit as God's speaking to us through this passage. But the first thing I really believe the Holy Spirit wants us to grasp today is that the struggle is real. The struggle is real. I want to tell you about 
if you haven't heard it, an amazing thing that happened in World War II. Um, an amazing person in World War II was Winston Churchill, and I'm inspired every time I hear some of his speeches. Just hold on that, guys, for one second. Because he was able to, with clarity, call the UK people to stand. Sometimes in the war to fight on their own before the US came into the war. But during World War II, you can keep scrolling now, there was an amazing event that happened in 1940. As British troops retreated through France under fire from an advancing German army, a massive evacuation was launched to bring the soldiers safely home. On May 26, Operation Dynamo began. Over nine days, a mammoth number of Allied troops were evacuated from the French seaport of Dunkirk to England. The seas remained unusually calm. The Royal Air Force, bitterly maligned by the, at that time by the army, fought vehemently to deny the enemy the total air supremacy which would have wrecked the operation. And at the outset, it was hoped that 45,000 men might be evacuated. In the end, 338,000 Allied troops reached England, including 26 French soldiers. It is now known as the miracle at Dunkirk. The miracle at Dunkirk. And if you look into some of the scenarios surrounding it, it truly was a miracle. There was cloud cover for two days. <laughs> uh, so the, the Luftwaffe bombers couldn't actually see the men on the beach. The King of England called for a day of prayer and fasting. The nation of Britain and the surrounding other nations that are part of the UK prayed collectively with one voice. <laughs> the seas were unusually calm. There was about 750 plus or between that and 850 little ships that came across the English Channel, sailing vessels and fishing vessels who came to help the men get on that and then so they could get onto the warships. And they describe the sea, which is typically very choppy and hard to manage, calm. For some reason, Hitler ordered the German troops to halt for two days so they could set up a perimeter around where they were surrounded and get a, ch a, a, a tunnel so that all the, the guys could come onto the beach. It was a miracle. A miracle. And on June 4, two weeks after becoming Prime Minister, Churchill reported to the UK House of Commons. And I want to give you a snippet from the end of his speech. Because this is the kind of language that Paul's using in that passage in Ephesians. <coughs> Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it was subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world with all its power and might steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. He stood up and he rallied the UK people to stand. And today in this message, through that passage, the possible, but today in this message, the Holy Spirit is saying to us, the struggle is real, but you can stand. We are fighting for the salvation of souls. There's a spiritual battle that is raging and God is calling us not to forget this as a church family. We've just been part of the Daring Faith campaign. Some of you may be sent spiritual opposition for the first time in a long time. That's because we're moving forward in faith. In 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Peter wrote this to the 
the scattered exiles, the persecuted church. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. We know the traits of the enemy. This verse explains it. He's powerful, like a roaring lion. He's wicked, he hates God and wants to hurt him as much as possible. So he tries to destroy human beings made in God's image. He's cunning. He prowls around looking for someone to devour. The devil schemes for his demonic army to steal hope, joy and godly purpose. He works to instill fear and dread and foster hate. He actively tries to kill faith and love and relationships and minds and health and churches and kingdom advancement. He opposes the gospel proclamation of witness. He blinds the minds of unbelievers and frustrates, tries to frustrate the ongoing ministry of Jesus. But Jesus has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The devil doesn't want Christians to be strong, firm and steadfast. He doesn't want us to be effective and fruitful in God's kingdom. He doesn't want people to be rescued out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Maybe you have been under spiritual attack without even realising it. Maybe there's a sense of apathy and disinterest that has crept into your life. And God wants you to take notice of it today and rise up in faith. And so now I'm walking forward in the strength of the Lord. Paul commands us to be alert and sober-minded. Paul states in 2 Corinthians 2, we are not unaware of the enemy's schemes. We're not dumbos. We're not naive. We know what this is about. (laughs) And next week, Pastor Bill's going to talk more about some of the specific strategies and schemes and how we can recognise that. I remember having a... um, God giving me uh, an encouragement or a picture for someone that was... ended up being encouraging. It wasn't a nice picture. (laughs) It was a picture of a snake crawling around, biting them. (laughs) And then I said, I feel like... God wants you to know that you're struggling to go to sleep at night. You're having not nice pictures or whatever and, then, and, and you feel like this is never going to end and you're never going to be able to go to sleep but this is the enemy's attempt to try and rob you of sleep and God wants to give you sleep. He wants to give you rest. And that person came forward and we talked about it and I got past Tanya and we prayed. They said, we ha- I have horrible images in my mind before I go to sleep. And I, and I can't get to sleep. I dread I have to have the light on. And we prayed and we took authority over that anything that was trying to intimidate that person in their sleep. Got them to confess and say out loud, thank you, Jesus, for your, for your rescuing power. Get lost, fear. <laughs> and from that night, they've never, ever had that thing come back and occur. They've been out of sleep and know they have the peace of God. 1 Peter 5, 9 to 10 says, Resist him, your enemy, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, and remember he's writing to the persecuted churches, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. That's a word for some of you at the moment. You feel like you're getting bombarded, but God is saying, it's all right, I'm with you. I'm going to continue to restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. Do you know, we can cultivate God confidence and grow to become stronger, firmer and more steadfast because even though the struggle is real and the Bible talks about this struggle, we also know that the victory is won. The victory is actually won. The message of the book of Revelation is that Jesus Christ has defeated Satan and will one day destroy him forever. And there's an amazing passage in Colossians 2, verse 13 to 15 in the Amplified. It says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, talking about worldliness, your old way of life, God made you alive together with Christ. 
having freely forgiven us all our sins, having cancelled out the certificate of debt consisting of legal demands which were in force against us and which were hostile to us. Paul's saying it was like there was this big long list. If anyone was to write down everything that you've ever done wrong or thought wrong or said wrong, Jesus took that big list and he nailed it to the cross. He says this certificate he has set aside and completely removed by nailing it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public spectacle of them or example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. Paul was likely referencing this ancient custom was if someone had a a debt against them and it was cancelled or paid in full, they would take that certificate and nail it to the top of a doorpost so everyone would know your debt has been paid. Jesus took your sin, everything that was, you know, the debt against you, everything you did to offend God and offend others, he took it all and he nailed it to the cross. Your debt has been paid in full. The rulers and authorities of Rome and of Israel conspired to put Jesus to death. They stripped him naked, held him up to public contempt and celebrated their victory over them. We know that he was taking our punishment, not for his own sin, but for ours. But N.T. Wright says the wonderful truth is that on the cross, God was stripping spiritual oppressors naked. He was holding them up to public contempt and leading them in his own triumphal procession. procession. In Christ, the crucified Messiah. In the days before the modern news media, the most spectacular method of announcing a far off victory to people at home was to march in triumph through the city, displaying the booty taken from conquered peoples and leading a host of bedraggled prisoners through the streets as a public spectacle. That's what Jesus did when he triumphed over the enemy on the cross. As Christ in this picture is the conquering general. The powers and authorities of the vanquished enemy <laughs> displayed as the spoils of battle before the entire universe. To the casual observer, the cross appears to be only an instrument of death, the symbol of Christ's defeat. But Paul sees it as Jesus' chariot of victory. Another commentator, McLeod, says it so well, Christ crucified was God's agent in disarming Satan and the cross was his instrument. The cross was not a defeat for Jesus. The cross was victory won. The resurrection was proof of that victory. He's alive, folks. Our Jesus, the conquering king, is alive. Death couldn't hold him. And when he said and cried out, it is finished on the cross, it was a victory cry. So not only has the victory been won, but we can stand firm because of the incredible greatness of his power. In Ephesians 6.10 it says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Back in Ephesians 1, Paul talks about this power. He says, he prays for us and for the Ephesians. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honour at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, right now today, right now in your situation, right now, He is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under His authority, under the authority of Christ, and has made Him head over all things for the benefit of His church. Wow. Some of you need to learn this verse and personalise it. I did this very early in my walk with Jesus and it comes back to me. The Holy Spirit, Spirit brings it back to mind time and time again. I have given you, Jesus is saying this to his disciples, that includes you if you're a follower of Christ. I have given you, Laura, authority over all the power of the enemy to tread on snakes and scorpions, those little pockets of 
things that pop up to try and attack you and nothing will harm you. Why don't you personalise it? Lord, you have given me authority to act in your name, to speak as you would speak, to tell demons to get lost as you would tell them to get lost. (laughs) Over all the power of the enemy that I can tread on those little snakes and scorpions that rise because Jesus has won the victory and nothing will harm me. Do we believe that? In 1 John 4, it says, The spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in this world. You're not a weak little weakling. You're a child of God. You have the spirit of Christ that raised Christ from the dead living in your body. So how is the Holy Spirit urging us to respond to this message today from God's word. I believe with renewed commitment, or for some of us perhaps for the first time, he's saying to all of us, take your stand and stand your ground. Take your stand and stand your ground. Take your stand, he says this in Ephesians 6, 11, put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand. You can take your stand. The scripture says it, that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes with God's help, with the things he's won for us, with his beautiful armour that he gives us. <clears throat> My friend, um, for a time period, every night before her husband would preach, he would have a, a sudden onset of pain. And she was thinking, what's going on? So she was praying for him and she'd be like, please God, would you take away his pain? Please God, would you help him? Please God. And then it wasn't really working. And she thought, you know what? I've been given all authority. All right. And so she, instead of praying and pleading, she started to stand and resist. And she said, in Jesus' name, you get off his body. <laughs> you get away from him. He's going to proclaim the gospel in the name of Jesus, in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and nothing is going to harm him. And it went straight away. (laughs) Some of you, instead of praying and pleading, you need to stand and resist. Stand and resist. Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore put on the complete armour of God in the Amplified so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the day of evil or of danger. And having done everything that the crisis demands to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. There's some things that are just spiritual attacks that pop up from time to time or spiritual opposition when you're trying to serve the Lord. There's other times where crises or intense attacks happen. And that's what Paul's talking about with the stand your ground. Stand your ground. Stand on the promises of God. Stand on the fact that you are in a state of grace that Jesus has brought you into, that nothing can separate you from his love. Start to pray and declare the promises of God. I'm going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I trust in the Lord. He's my shield. He's the lifter of my head. I take authority over these things. Are you trying to come against my family? I come against you in the name of the Lord. Get lost. That kind of thing, right? You don't have to be loud, but you can pray with confidence. (laughs) so we're going to do that today in Romans 5 2 in the end part it says Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege in the NIV it says this state of grace you are in a state of grace that is where you are located if you're going through a difficult time Jesus loves you he hasn't left you he is fighting for you he is with you you are in a state of grace you can't escape it you can never leave it it's where you're planted it's where you've been rescued and brought into and so you can start to pray and thank him for where you are even though your circumstances look crazy how about we pray Lord, I thank you for your word to us this morning. It's a strong word. It's a rally cry. (laughs) But we receive it.
if you've never given your life to Jesus. He nailed your debt, the debt you owed God for all the things you've ever done wrong. He nailed that to the cross. God is not angry at you. He sent Jesus to die for you. He loves you. I just invite you, wherever you are, if you're watching at home, if you've never given your life to Christ, do it now. Just open up your life to him. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I don't know anything much else to pray, but thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for the debt that you paid on my behalf. Jesus, I give you my life. And I want you to come into me and help me to follow you by your spirit. And if you pray that and you mean that with all your heart, he has and he will. He has come into your life and he will never leave. And he will help you to live for him. And we'd love to support you in that. But you're now a child of God. You're my brother or sister in Christ. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. Hallelujah. There's many in this room I know that God has spoken to us today. And He's saying to some of you, maybe have you left your post? Have you felt like some things are too impossible or just maybe you've been beaten down, discouraged, but God is saying, take your stand. I just invite you to stand where you are. If He's saying that to you today, take your stand. Just stand up. We're going to pray together. It might be that you're standing for a family member. He's, you're saying, yes, God, I'm taking my stand. I'm engaging in the battle. And I'm trusting in your power to help me. Let's just stretch out our hand. You keep, there's more time. You stand if you need to stand. We're going to pray. Just stretch out your hand to anyone who's standing. Just pray and use your faith right now. Father, we thank you for every person in this place who's standing in your presence, saying, that's me, Lord. That's me, Lord. I've felt weak or I've felt I didn't know what to do or I've, sometimes I've let things distract me, but I'm standing now and I'm standing in the power and the strength of God and I'm saying, yes, Lord, use me. Thank you, Lord, that I have authority over all the power of the enemy to tread on those snakes and scorpions that nothing will harm me. I'm standing for my family. I'm standing even though there might be spiritual forces against me. I thank you, Jesus. Just start to thank Him out loud. I thank you, Jesus, that you've won the victory. I thank you, Jesus, that a complete authority is yours. I thank you, Jesus, that I have nothing to fear. I thank you, Jesus, that you surround me with your presence, that though that looks like there's not much on my side, that You are surrounding me. And if You are surrounding me, You are greater because greater is He that lives within me than He that is in the world. And so I'm standing now and I'm putting on that armour. I'm putting it on everything You won for me, Jesus. The sandals of the Gospel of peace, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, that right standing before You, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. I take up the shield of faith. And I'm going to trust You as I walk forward in the power of the Spirit. I thank You in Jesus' Name. Let's give the Lord a clap offering and thank Him for His victory and His power. (coughs) You guys can take your seats. I want to do one other thing. Can we all stand together? Because then we can do it together. (laughs) I talked about standing your ground. We are going to pray and we are going to stand our ground. I felt there's some different situations happening. I forgot to take my piece of paper up with me. Here it is. You might identify with one of these. It doesn't matter if I don't read out your situation. God knows it. All right. And I want you to come forward, slip out of your seat. You know, that's me. That's me. I'm going through a crisis. There's intense stuff happening. I want to stand my ground. All right, so you can just, even as I'm reading, slip out of your seat and come forward. We're going to pray. 
I felt like there's someone here whose baby has been diagnosed with a congenital heart disease or someone watching online and Jesus wants to meet you. He wants to do something in your life and in your baby's life. I feel like there's a man here or listening online who has had profound hearing loss in both ears. Jesus wants to heal you. I feel like there's someone who has had severe pain in their nerves and their nerve endings. Jesus wants to heal you. I feel like there's someone who's breathing, maybe multiple people who've been affected by COVID. I feel like there's people here who are asthmatic and have been afraid of getting sick through COVID and Jesus wants to set you free from fear. I feel like there's a little girl who's been waking up in a family with the same nightmare going on for weeks. That's just a few things I felt the Holy Spirit lay on my heart. Maybe that's you. Maybe there's another situation that's happening, but you just, if you need Jesus' power to intervene and if you want to stand your ground, you just slip out of your seat. You come forward now. We're going to pray for you. Just right now, slip out of your seat. Our prayer ministry team, I don't want you to stand in front. I want you to stand behind and put your hands on people's backs. And then I'm going to pray a general prayer, all right? Come forward, love. That's good. Come on, come forward. Respond to the Lord. He is here by the power of His presence and He wants to touch people's lives. Come forward now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If you need to come from upstairs, we've got time. Just slip out of your seat and come. Whatever situation comes to mind, you say, I need the Lord to intervene. Keep coming. That's good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yep. There's more people coming, it's good. Prayer ministry team, can you just come and just put your hand on someone's back? Just on their back. They're gonna start to probably gently pray in their prayer language over you. Just stand behind them, that's good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you need intervention in your marriage, in your family, there's broken family situation and you need the presence and power of God to intervene. That's good. Any board members who are here, you come and pray. Life group members, you come and pray. We're going to stretch out your hand wherever you are. We're going to pray and believe. Praying and believe and putting our trust in the power of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Pastors, if you're here, you come and pray. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We just pray for every person who's standing at the front here, Lord. We thank You for Your presence and Your power in this place. Lord Jesus, we thank You that nothing is impossible for You. So with the authority that we have in Jesus, we pray over these people and we say, enemy be gone, we resist You in the Name of Jesus. They're standing their ground. They're standing their ground on the promises of God. They're standing their ground for their family. They're standing their ground for their health. I pray health and healing in the Name of Jesus, that You would just release Your healing power right now into people's body. Jesus, that You would manifest Your presence and Your power in the mighty Name of Jesus. Thank You.